Okay, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the second day um, of, uh, of the workshop. Um, what we are going to do today is we will have a couple of talks. Uh, we'll continue from the uh, themes from yesterday. Uh, the first talk will be on primordial black hole dark matter. Um, and this is part two, but lecture one. Um, and then we will have a lecture on dark matter two. So that will be the second lecture. Um, so for today's uh, first uh, presentation, we'll have Yasin Ali Hamoud. Um, he is an assistant professor at uh, NYU. Um, he is an expert in theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, in particular things related to uh, recombination, large scale structure, dark matter, so on. So themes which are uh, very well related to, uh, to the topic of the school. Um, and then um, he is, uh, he is going to start off uh, uh, with this primordial black hole lecture now. So uh, Yasin, please okay, well, go ahead. For, uh, for people who wanted to ask questions, you can please type them in the chat window uh, or in the YouTube chat if you're listening to YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, take away Yasin, thanks. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. So uh, my understanding is that yesterday you had two lectures by Eli, or one lecture by Eli Kovacs, thank you, on Thomas of Black Holes. So I assume that Eli covered uh, the motivations behind primordial black holes and the formation mechanisms. And today I will talk about, today and tomorrow, about uh, constraints on the abundance of primordial black holes from the CMB and from gravitational waves. And so today we will we'll talk about uh, CMB constraints. So uh, the plan, we're going to have two parts. The first part will be to discuss the basic physics of the CMB. Uh, we will talk about CMB spectral distortions and CMB anisotropies, and I will explain this in more detail. And the focus will be what can the CMB tell us about energy injection in the early universe? And then in the second part, we will see how primordial black holes can either directly or indirectly inject energy in the early universe. And as a result, this will, uh, we can use this to predict observables from primordial black holes in the CMB. Thus, if we don't see these observables to set constraints to their abundance. We will discuss three different uh, processes of energy injection. First of all, the dissipation of small scale perturbations uh, through silk damping. Secondly, uh, and this we will see can uh, probe uh, very massive primordial black holes. Secondly, on the the other extreme end, I will talk briefly about Hawking radiation, which can probe ultra-light primordial black holes. And last, I will talk about the creating primordial black holes. All right, so let's first uh, briefly review or view uh, the basic physics of the cosmic microwave background. So first of all, what do we, when we talk about the CMB, there are two aspects of the CMB that we, uh, I want to emphasize here. So in every direction of this in the sky, uh, as shown in this map, here we're used to seeing these maps of the CMB, which really show one single quantity in each direction, but really in every direction you have a full spectrum. Okay. This is here showing the Planck function. So in every direction of the sky, you really measure an intensity as a function of frequency and direction. You can always define some temperature T uh, in such a way. Now, this temperature, if it's the same in every direction and the same in every frequency, uh, this is the so-called CMB monopole. If this temperature has some additional piece which does not depend on direction, but does depend on frequency, whereby this means that this is not actually a perfect black body spectrum, we call this piece a spectral distortion. This is just to set the vocabulary. Then if this piece this temperature here has a piece that does not depend on frequency, hence it is really a black body function, but does depend on direction in the sky. We call this anisotropies. This is what Planck measures, for example. And finally, there is a piece which can depend on both spatial directions and frequency, and those are spectral spatial distortions, which we will not talk about in, in here, but one example would be, for example, the Sunyaev Zeldovich spectral, dis spe spectral distortions due to clusters. Okay, so this is just to set the language here. So 
protagonist and stage of the story we're going to be talking about. So first of all, we I'm going to talk, uh, everything will take place after the universe's temperature was below one MeV or so. So Big Bang nucleos nucleosynthesis has already happened. So the so-called baryon content using the usual uh, misnomer for baryons, which contain electrons, protons, and helium nuclei. There's about eight helium nuclei per 100 protons in the early universe. Then the very important protagonist is CMB photons. These two protagonists are very in very close contact with each other uh, for the first 400,000 years, and I will get back to this. Then we have neutrinos, which so they're about 10, to 10 billion uh, photons per, uh, per baryon, and they're a comparable number of neutrinos and antineutrinos. These neutrinos are collisionless in the sense that they don't have at these epochs, they no longer scatter or uh, have any non-gravitational interactions with the rest of the plasma. And finally, we have also dark matter, whatever it might be. And this, for as far as we're concerned in terms of the CMB, for most applications can be anything that is collisionless, i.e. doesn't have any interactions besides gravitational, and is cold, meaning it has very small uh, streaming velocities. And all of these protagonists are interacting through uh, gravity. They uh, feel each other's mutual gravitational interactions. OK, so the few things you need to know about spectral distortions. In the first two months of the universe, which corresponds to redshift greater than about 2 million, uh, temperature greater than about kilo electron volts, Photons are very easily created and destroyed and uh, thermalized due to Bremsstrahlung and double Compton uh, processes. And as a consequence, no matter what happens in the first two months, you can dump a lot of energy in the uh, early universe. You can extract a lot of energy from the early universe. The photons will thermalize and will uh, reach the uh, a black body, a perfect black body spectrum. As long as this whatever process happens, happens in the first two months. After the first two months, however, if you inject or extract energy from the photon baryon plasma, uh, you can no longer thermalize this energy, and this will lead to a distortion of the CMB black body spectrum. This is just a toy picture here showing uh, if I have a chemical potential, positive or negative, how you would get a distortion of black body spectrum. So what is the typical amplitude of this distortion, the fractional distortion to the CMB uh, intensity? This is roughly speaking an integral over time of, so this rho dot inch is the energy that you inject per unit time per unit volume. Rho gamma is the energy density of CMB photons. And so you see that this is a dimensionless quantity. And this integral over time starts uh, at this critical time of about two months, which corresponds to a redshift about 10 to the 6. So just this is a, a very simple thing to remember. And actually, if you know this, you can do lots of simple order of magnitude estimates uh, as to whether some processes can generate a sufficiently large spectral distortions to be observable or not. So uh, observational data we have. Uh, dates from the late 80s, early 90s uh, by the COBE satellite and specifically the FIRES instruments, which measure the temperature of the CMB spectrum to a very high precision, 2.7255, et cetera, Kelvin, and also showed by comparing the spectrum of the CMB to a uh, man-made uh, black body emitter that the CMB was a perfect black body within the estimated precision of this man-made emitter, i.e. within uh, something like 10 to minus four. And so what this tells us, if you go back to this equation, and we're gonna use it later, it tells us that it, it constrains the amount of energy, non-standard energy that could have happened in the early universe. Okay. So moving forward in time, let's now, uh, move to talking about CMB and isotropy. So an important process is recombination. So I was talking about the first two months after the Big Bang. Nothing uh, too much happens until about 20,000 years when uh, helium captures the first electron. Then after 130,000 years or so, helium captures, recombines for the second time and becomes fully neutral. 
And when the universe turns about 400,000 years, hydrogen uh, recombines, or rather combines for the first time, and forms uh, neutral hydrogen atoms for the first time. This happens, of course, uh, not instantaneously. And uh, we can, in fact, compute very precisely how this happened as a function of time. So this is showing the ionized fraction, which is normalized, uh, which is the number density of free electrons divided by the number density of protons plus hydrogen atoms. And so you see it starts and normalizes to show you that it starts at 1.16 because helium has two electrons and there is eight helium atoms per 100 uh, protons. Okay, so this is the three recombinations I was talking about. So why is this important for CMB and isotropies? So this is showing uh, pictorially uh, the universe as it changes in time. You see you have more and more neutral hydrogen atoms as you go back in time and the temperature goes down as you go, as you move, sorry, as you move forward in time. So if uh, you have some CMB photons, they will Thomson scatter off the free electrons. And as the universe becomes not only more neutral, but also more dilute, the density decreases, the frequency of scatterings will decrease up until the moment where uh, photons will scatter one last time and then no longer scatter and propagate uh, up until today, uh, unimpeded. This is the last scatter. If we put this in a bigger context, these photons travel through time and space for, through the formation of the first stars, first galaxies, etc., all the way to us. Now, from our point of view, we uh, live at the center of our observable universe. Obviously, we are not at the center of the universe, but from our point of view, we see these photons that have last scattered at the last scattering epoch, but from every direction that we may look at, we see photons coming from us from this last scattering epoch. And so from our point of view, it looks like we seeing these photons which come from a last scattering surface. Um, so this is what we see as the cosmic microwave background is the photons coming from this epoch at which they scattered for the last time when the universe was about 400,000 years old at a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin. And today, this is redshifted to about 3 degrees Kelvin. So this uh, not only has fluctuations in temperature of a few parts in 100,000, but also has fluctuations in polarization, which have been measured to exquisite precision by WMAP and now by the Planck satellite. So what are we seeing exactly in this uh, surface of last scattering? So before this uh, critical time of about 400,000 years, photons and baryons are tightly coupled through Thomson scattering. Okay, so photons scatter a lot. So they have a very short mean free path. So photons, because they move at the speed of light, uh, they have a very large pressure. Their pressure is basically uh, C over three times their density. Baryons, if they were, but photons, if they were on their own, they have a big pressure, but they would not be confined. If, if it wasn't for the uh, electrons, they would just free stream. So it's nice to have a big pressure, but if you don't have anything that confines you, uh, you would just free stream. Baryons, on the other hand, on their own, would have a very small pressure relative to those of the protons, but they provide containment and they make the photons uh, basically together, uh, they become an ideal fluid. So this containment means that they don't have free streaming and the photons provide a large pressure. So now if you imagine starting in an idealized setup, if you have some small oops, over density, sorry, in the early universe, and if you put this over density in a fluid which has a large uh, pressure, an ideal fluid, this will launch a uh, sound wave. This sound wave will propagate for as long as we really have an ideal fluid, which is about 400,000 years. After that, photons will decouple from uh, the, the baryons and will start free streaming. Now, of course, in practice, we don't have one single inhomogeneity. We have a bunch of, uh, with some, some uh, essentially stochastic initial conditions. And so what happens is that for about 400,000 years, you have a superposition of many incoherent sound waves, oops, which oscillate for about 400,000 years. 
And here, this equation I am showing. I don't know if this is on your way, this bar, sorry. This equation here is just saying that uh, this is just an oscillation for every Fourier mode k. Eta is a conformal time. The photon uh, density perturbation oscillates at with a, again, the sound speed here is c over square root of three is close to the speed of light. And this is the last oscillation after 400,000 years is this last snapshot is what you see as imprinted on the surface of flash scattering. And this is what you see as the cosmic microwave background. All right, so what do we measure about the CMB uh, anisotropies given this map? One, computes the angular power spectrum, which basically is the variance of temperature fluctuations as a function of angular scale. This is illustrated here. I took these slides from uh, Matt Madavacheril. So this is the CMB power spectrum. On low L, that corresponds to the fluctuations on very large angular scales, as illustrated here, as we move through larger and larger L, it corresponds to fluctuations through smaller and smaller angular scales. As you see, we're cranking up through this curve, you see that the contrast becomes higher. And at the peak of this curves, which corresponds to basically an angular scale of about one degree, which corresponds to the typical, to the angular scale suspended by this uh, distance that sound waves can travel during 400,000 years. This is where you have the maximum contrasts. And as you go down for smaller scales, you see that this is a smaller scale and the contrast decreases and eventually you have almost no visible fluctuations. So again, this summarizes the variance of fluctuations as a function of angular scale. And we're gonna discuss why we have this uh, suppression at small scales and why it's relevant for parametric black holes, why it's related to constraints of parametric black holes. So this is the measurements. This is, these are the data points from Planck. Uh, again, this is the temperature uh, power spectrum. You can also compute the cross power spectrum of temperature and polarization fluctuations and the power spectrum of polarization itself. And these multiple data points are fit beautifully by a rather simple uh, model, which only depends on six cosmological parameters. The six parameters contain two parameters which parameterize the uh, amplitude of the initial perturbations, uh, one for the overall amplitude and one for the scale dependence. You have three parameters that quantify the energy budget of the universe uh, and its constituents. So how many baryons we have, how, many, how much dark matter there is and how much, uh, say what, how much dark energy there is today. And uh, there is uh, one parameter which quantifies when the universe got re-ionized and this changes also uh, the details of the uh, CMB power spectrum. So from these parameters, as you probably know, the success story of the CMB as a uh, tool to uh, do high precision cosmology, these very tiny error bars imply that we measure cosmological parameters. For example, the abundance of dark matter to very high precision. Okay, so dark matter has an abundance which is known to within a percent, even though we still don't know what exactly dark matter is made of. We can still, provided we just assume it's some collisionless cold fluids, know exactly how much there is. Okay, so CMB and isotropies, as I hope I have already uh, illustrated, are extremely sensitive to the recombination history of the universe. How exactly the universe went from being fully ionized to almost fully neutral. And there are several codes. There are a couple, two codes that compute this to very high precision. I'll just uh, take advantage of this to advertise my students' work, Nanum Lee, who wrote this new version of HiRec, which runs in uh, one millisecond and computes the recombination history in, with an accuracy of a few parts in 10 to the minus, in 10 to the four. So to illustrate uh, visually what happens if you were to change recombination and to add some non-standard recombination, What's the effect on CMB power spectra? Here I'm adding a bump in recombination history in the ionization fraction of 10%. And what I'm gonna do is just I'm gonna move it forward in time. And you will see how this affects the CMB power spectra. 
basically, if you want to think about it mathematically, I'm showing you some sort of smoothed out Green's function response of CMB power spectra to the ionization history. So you see that as this pump goes through the epoch of last scattering, the effect is the largest. And as you move the bump to later and later times, where the density of hydrogen is smaller and smaller and the optical depth becomes smaller and smaller, the effect becomes uh, less pronounced. So this is, and you see that you get a damping of uh, power spectra of small scales and you really have a strong effect on uh, polarization. So this is just to illustrate again that the CMB anisotropies are extremely sensitive to the ionization history. So we can use this sensitivity to ionization history to, again, just like in the case of spectral distortions, uh, we can infer something about the thermal history of the universe and about whether some processes may have injected energy. So if some process injects some energy again with some energy injection rates, per, so per unit time, per unit volume, first of all, in the calculation, and this also holds for spectral distortions, not all this energy is necessarily deposited in the plasma. Okay, so for example, if some process injects only neutrinos, you can inject a lot of neutrinos. This is after you know, a temperature of an MeV, uh, neutrinos do not interact with the rest of the plasma. And so basically they will propagate and it will be completely, the CMB will not be uh, sensitive to this injection. So the first step is to always compute the efficiency with which this energy is actually deposited into the plasma. And this depends on the details of what exactly, what kind of particles you inject and uh, what kind of, what spectrum they have. And for example, if you're interested into, in this, you can uh, look up Tracy Slatter's work. She has done a lot of work on how to compute these efficiency for, for example, dark matter annihilation and decays. So this energy which is deposited can either be deposited in, in a, uh, and heat up the gas. It can uh, lead to direct additional ionizations of hydrogen or helium. So it can, it can ionize them more than they would be by regular CMB photons, for example. Or it could excite them to a higher excited level from which then standard CMB photons can ionize them. So this would be an indirect way to basically cause uh, additional ionization. And if you heat up the gas, you will also change the recombination coefficient uh, of uh, hydrogen and helium. So basically the net effect is that in addition to changing the temperature of the gas, which is not directly observable uh, in terms of the CMB, you will change the rate at which, so Xe is the free electron fraction, again, the ratio of the number density of free electrons to that of protons and hydrogen. So this piece is computed by recombination codes. Uh, and this would add some additional um, rate of ionizations. And again, to have just an order of magnitude estimate, to estimate what, what is effective, you take the energy, the rate of energy deposition per unit time, per unit volume. If you divide it by the number density of hydrogen atoms, this gives you uh, an energy deposition per uh, hydrogen atom per unit time. And if you divide this by the ionization, the ionization energy of hydrogen, roughly speaking, this quantity gives you the number of ionizing photons uh, per unit time. This is the fraction of neutral hydrogen. So if you take the number of ionizing photons deposited per unit time times the fraction of neutral hydrogen, this roughly gives you the rate of change of the free electron fraction due to this energy uh, injection into the plasma. Okay, so this is the end of part one about just the basic physics. So to summarize, we've learned that the uh, frequency spectrum of the CMB, if it's distorted away from a perfect black body spectrum, we call this spectral distortions. And this is a probe of energy or heat injection or also extraction into the plasma at redshifts below 2 million. And to estimate roughly the amplitude of the distortions all you need to know is compute the integral over time of the volumetric rate of energy deposition into the plasma divided by the energy density of CMB photons. The second thing is that CMB anisotropies, which are measured to 
basically 1% or less than 1% precision by Planck. Uh, they are very sensitive to the ionization history of the universe. This determines when photons scattered for the last time, and it determines when photons decoupled and stopped, as photons and baryons stop being an ideal fluid. And again, if you inject energy into the plasma, you can also affect this recombination history. And a simple way to estimate this is to divide the number of uh, the energy, is to compute the rate of ionizing photons deposited per unit time into the plasma. So before moving on to the application for measured black holes, uh, are there any questions? I see in the chat, are there any questions? Yeah, sure. So. Um, um... Let me ask one of the questions. Uh, this comes from Aditya Vijaykumar. Uh, so he's asking about the large L values in the polarization spectrum and what are what is the reason for the high errors um, at large L? Uh, for the high error at large L here. Right. I see. So um, basically, the, every instrument, whether it is Planck or WMAP or any instrument, has some angular resolution. The angular resolution will be different for intense for temperature and polarization, and Planck has a better angular resolution for temperature. So the error eventually blow up as you go to high L, which is small angular scales, just because the instrument cannot resolve very small scales. So instruments such as uh, ACT, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, or or SPT, the South Pole Telescope, can measure the polarization to to uh, much smaller angular scales, for example. Yep. So it's um, just a matter of instrumental angular resolution. Um, so then there's uh, another question from Suchetna Chatterjee. Uh, can the role of chemical potential be discussed after the first two months of the Big Bang? Yeah, so, so, after, so between the first two months and I'm not remembering exactly in terms of years, uh, I think it's something like 10,000 years, but in terms of redshift, so between redshift of 2 million and redshift of roughly 50,000, whatever energy is injected, photons can no longer be created and destroyed easily. However, so thank you, 10,000 years roughly. So however, photons can have their energy change uh, very easily. So they can thermalize in terms of their energy. And so whatever energy you inject will result in a chemical potential, in a non-zero chemical potential. So there's a unique form of the distortion uh, if energy is injected between redshift 2 million and about 10,000. After redshift 10,000, the actual detailed shape of the distortion depends on, on what you do. If you inject energy in terms of heating the gas, then you will have a Compton Y distortion, which is exactly the same distortion as the Sunya Evzabdovich distortion. But if you're imagining injecting energy in the form of a line, for example, if you have a decay of a particle at a specific uh, energy, then you will have this line that gets broadened up a little bit, but it's not going to, you know, the distortion will depend on exactly the energy of the line and the time dependence of the injection, et cetera. Right. Uh, so then there's uh, one question. My guess is this you will answer later. So feel free to um, say that. What can be the sources of non-standard energy injections in the early universe? This is from Sohani Gupta. Uh, the sources of non-standard energy in the early universe. Okay. So uh, one which is uh, studied the most probably is uh, dark matter annihilation or dark matter decay. Perhaps Neil will talk about it. So this is uh, mostly constraining, constrained through CMB anisotropies. So if the dark matter is say its own antiparticle and once in a while dark matter part particles and antiparticles can annihilate and say create electron positron pairs or photon pairs this is a source of energy injection and from the cmb from planck we have some limit on the dark matter annihilation cross section there are also some limit on the dark matter decay uh, rates you could also imagine a primordial magnetic fields, which would uh, the energy of which would dissipate into the plasma. I'm not familiar with the detailed physics of this, uh, and we're going to see primordial black holes. Uh, now. You could also have dark matter uh, elastic scattering, uh, which even if naively you would think elastic scattering should not dissipate energy, but if dark matter is cold and if it's non-relativistic, this actually can extract energy from 
the plasma and lead to spectral distortions. Okay. Um, so then there's one more and then maybe uh, we can move. Uh, so similar to CMB photons, uh, is there a possibility of a cosmic neutrino background? Can you tell us about its last scattering surface? Uh, this one okay. Is so, okay, that's an interesting question. So the, the, the last scattering epoch for neutrinos is much earlier than that of photons, right? It's when the temperature was about an MeV or so. However, because neutrinos are not quite relativistic, they have a small but finite mass, at least two of them, then this last scattering surface actually is closer to us counterintuitively than the, than the last scattering surface of the CMB. And uh, neutrinos, again, because they have a mass, they are affected along the line of sight by, uh, so you know, just like CMB has gravitational lensing, but CMB photons remain relativistic, neutrinos get deflected much more uh, by uh, the nonlinear structure along the line of sight. So the cosmic neutrino background may have much larger uh, anisotropies than the CMB. But that's a very good question. You can also, yeah, I guess you can yeah. search for this. Well, there's one more if you want to take it. Uh, uh, this is if the energy in density in is injected at some specific length scale, um, and it does not homogenize, then does the CMB power spectrum get affected at some specific L values? And this is from Ajit. Good, I see. If the energy is, is, is injected at specific length scales, and I suppose it's late enough. So, okay, one case of this, uh, so, okay, that's a question that I guess we can all think about, but one simple case of this is the sunyaev zeljovic effect. Right. Okay. So you have clusters along the line of sight. They're very, very small. They are very localized. In this case, the energy is injected in the, in the terms of uh, um, inverse Compton scattering of CMB photons. And yes, the CMB power spectrum is affected at very small scales because of the, the Poisson shot noise of these clusters. More generally, I suppose so, yes, you would have some uh, you will you will affect the CMB at some specific L values. Right. Okay, uh, so that basically finishes the questions. I guess we can move on to the next part and then. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we were here. Okay. And by the way, if I don't finish uh, this today, I will of course continue tomorrow before going to gravitational waves. So. We're going to talk about three uh, processes by which primordial black holes can either directly or indirectly inject energy. The first process is the dissipation of small scale perturbations, also known as silk damping. So let me talk about silk damping in general, and then we'll see how it applies to primordial black holes. So what is an ideal fluid? So I told you that the photons and baryons constitute an ideal fluid. An ideal fluid is basically a fluid whose mean free path is infinitely small. So between collisions, the path that particles uh, take is basically zero. However, it's never actually strictly zero. So for example, in terms of photon baryons, you can compute what is the mean free path for photons between different Thomson scattering events. So this is the proper mean free path. So one over the number density of scatterers times the Thomson cross section. The co-moving mean free path will be obtained by uh, dividing this by uh, the scale factor. And if you just plug in numbers here for the Thompson cross section, so some number to keep in mind, which is useful to know, is that the de number density of hydrogen around recombination is a few hundred per cubic centimeter. You plug that in, you find a mean free path about a few uh, megaparsecs uh, at redshift 1,000. So that's definitely not small. It's actually a scale which is, uh, you know, a cosmological scale. And this, so. Uh, because this is not an ideal fluid, this induces a viscous force. So in addition to the pressure force and the gravity, you know, and gravity fluid, the fluid has a viscous force, which is going to be proportional to the mean free path. So if the mean free path goes to zero, it goes to zero times the Laplacian of the velocity. And if you make sure that this is, has the correct dimensions, you see you need to add some typical uh, velocity here and this is the sound speed. Or again, the sound speed is zero root three. This viscous force does two things. 
So now I didn't write this equation here, but if you wrote the full uh, fluid equations, you also have the pressure term. And if there was no viscous force, the solution would be some uh, acoustic oscillations. Now, if you add this viscous force, you will have some, this is the acoustic oscillations and you will have some damping of this acoustic oscillations. And you can solve this, you can obtain the solution by using, for example, a WKB approximation. And the scale that comes here is called the silk damping scale. And it is basically an integral over conformal time of one over, uh, of this uh, co-moving mean tree path. Um, in terms of number, this is something like 0.1 inverse megaparsecs uh, at redshift of a thousand. So this, as I said, this is viscosity damps exponentially these acoustic oscillations at small enough scales. So if we start here with some almost scale invariant power spectrum. So here I've taken some power spectrum which has uh, goes as k to the minus 0 0.04, which is what is actually observed in the CMB. As time goes on, the actual density perturbation, this is the RMS, and this is you know, a schematic representation. The RMS density fluctuation as time goes on is exponentially damped beyond the silk damping scale. And the silk damping scale is about k of 0.1, which corresponds to a multiple L of about 1,000 at the time of last scattering, which explains why you had this exponential damping of the CMB power spectrum. Now, all of this difference here, so this actually generates, this uh, leads to energy dissipation. So as you know, if you have sound waves, sound waves do carry uh, an energy density, which is rho gamma, in this case, the photon, times the sound speed squared times the uh, variance of the density fluctuation. So this is this, spe this uh, spatial uh, variance, and this can be obtained by integrating over k, over log k of, this is the variance per log k of photon density perturbations. And so this goes up until this dissipation scale, this silt damping scale, because beyond this, the, this is exponentially damped. So this is the, at any given time, the energy density of the sound wave. So what is the energy dissipated is basically the time derivative of this. So the energy dissipated per unit volume per unit time is just the time derivative of this. And if you take the time derivative of this, it all comes from the, the limit of the integral. And so you get the sound speed squared times d log k damping dt times this delta gamma squared. Now, if you remember what is the spectral distortion, order of magnitude is going to be integral over time dt of the energy injection uh, per unit time per unit volume divided by uh, rho gamma. So if I take integral over dt of this, I will just get cs squared times d log k damping times this. And I have to do this from time equals uh, from redshift of 2 million uh, and below, which means up until the dissipation scale corresponding to redshift of 2 million, which is about 10 to the four inverse megaparsecs, co-moving. Okay, so this is the spectral distortion order of magnitude due to the dissipation of acoustic waves because of the finite mean free path of photons is going to be sound speed squared, which is basically speed of light squared over three, integral over all wave numbers up until uh, the k of about 10 to the four inverse megaparsecs, which corresponds to this, the silk damping scale at redshift two million. So given that Firas, Kobe Firas measures that this delta I nu over I nu is less than 10 to the minus four or so, one can then translate, let me get back to this. One can then translate this into a limit on the primordial uh, density fluctuation. Uh, the variance of parameter density fluctuation. Um, and you get, uh, this should be a squared, I'm sorry, I forget the square here. So this gives you some upper limit on the primordial density fluctuations for wave numbers up to about 10,000 and below. So above 10,000 smaller scales, 
would dissipate earlier, would dissipate before redshift of 2 million. And as a consequence, it would just lead to a, an increase of the CMB temperature, which you know, we don't know what would be the base CMB temperature today. We just observe the CMB. But those ones would lead to distortions to the CMB spectrum. OK, so now what you have probably learned from Eli's lectures is how do promoter black holes, uh, the most, uh, the simplest way to form promoter black holes would be the, the, as a result from the collapse of relatively large density fluctuations in the early universe of order 10% or 30% or so. Now, if those primordial perturbations are Gaussian, the question is, in order to get 10% fluctuation, if the variance, sorry, if the, if the variance is no more than 10 minus 5, so the RMS is no more than a few times 10 to minus 3, or let's say several, yeah, several times 10 minus 3, then it's extremely, it's exponentially suppressed by a lot to get to 10% density perturbations. So basically, as a result, again, if PBHs result from collapse of these density perturbations, and if these density perturbations are Gaussian distributed, then basically, as shown in this paper, uh, the spectral distortion limits imply that PBHs with masses greater than about two times 10 to the four solar masses which is the mass forming at redshift uh, about 2 million, uh, cannot, can, can only make a ridiculously small fraction of the dark matter. You see here, this is the fraction of dark matter. It goes down to you know, less than 10 minus 18. And there is, it doesn't continue forever, but basically we're now heading to masses which are so large that they're ruled out for uh, other reasons anyway. Okay, so this is the first, uh, constraint, which is an indirect constraint from, from dissipation of acoustic waves, and it's a, a constraint on very massive primordial black holes. And it basically rules them out if uh, the density block, uh, above uh, 20,000 solar masses if density per perturbation are Gaussian. Okay, a second process we'll briefly talk about is Hawking evaporation. So the uh, rate of mass. Uh, loss through Hawking evaporation is basically the Planck mass cubed over mass squared per Planck time. This has the right units. And from this, you can calculate the time scale for Hawking evaporation, which is taking m divided by this. And it's just the Planck time times m over m Planck cubed. If you ask what is the mass here, m is the mass of the primordial black hole, that would be required for uh, black holes to have evaporated already by the present time that gives you a mass of 10 to the 15 grams or below that. So for lighter PBHs, well, they cannot make all the dark matter for sure because you know we need to have dark matter today. So uh, they cannot make more, and this is um, just making an approximate number here, at the very least, at the very uh, most, they, they have to be less than about a percent of the dark matter because this is roughly our order of precision of measurement of dark matter abundance. If PBHs are above this uh, threshold here, then they will not have evaporated by the present time, but they will be continuously evaporating through cosmic history. And as a consequence, you know, they evaporate into a bunch of particles, uh, depending on exactly the evaporation temperature, which you can also obtain from similar uh, arguments. Uh, and as a consequence, they will inject energy into the plasma. The rate of energy injection per unit time per unit volume will be the number density of parameter black holes times the you know, mass, rest mass energy that they uh, evaporate per unit time. And so this is just the fraction of dark matter into parameter black holes times the density of dark matter divided by the mass of the PBH. And so plugging this in, you get this equation here. OK, so now let's use. Uh, the estimate that we made for how this can affect recombination. Again, if you take the energy deposited per unit time, per unit volume divided by the number of density of hydrogen times the ionization energy, this gives you roughly the change in the free electron fraction uh, rate, uh, rate of change. 
so if I plug in the equation that, that I derived uh, just before, this, ten to, ten to, this ten EV is 10 to minus 8 times GEV. So this gives me 10 to minus 8 times rho B. If I plug in what I had before, I get something like 10 to the 5 times this efficiency of deposition uh, over 10% times the fraction of PBHs times 10 to the 15 over M cubed, or 10 to 15 grams here over M cubed. So as a very, 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 very rough estimate of how sensitive the CMB anisotropies are to changes in the free electron fraction. Uh, and by the way, here I got delta XC dot and to get delta XC, I multiply by the time scale of recombination, the age of the universal recombinations, which is about 300,000 years. So roughly the CMB is sensitive to 1% changes of the recombination history around the last scattering epoch. And so if I say that this is less than 1%, you get this upper limit, estimated upper limit of 10 to the minus seven in terms of the dark matter fraction in PBHs times n over 10 to the m over 10 to the 15 grams cubed. And lo and behold, if you do a much, much more precise calculation, so this, in this case, I was a bit lucky to get the correct estimate, but for different uh, energy injection processes, you really want to do the more accurate calculation. But in this case, you see that it actually gives you the pretty much the correct uh, order of magnitude of the upper limit on the dark or the PBH fraction in dark matter as a function of mass. And it definitely exp explains the scaling as uh, M cube. Now, this is, so this is how you can rule out or set very, very strong limits on very, very light primordial black holes uh, through their evaporation and through their effect on CMB anisotropies. Now, what I did not do here, but I leave it to you as an exercise, is estimate the amplitude of spectral distortions from the same process and ask how constraining FIRAS is. And you will see that it is significantly less constraining uh, in this case than uh, the effect on the recombination history. And the same thing will hold true for primordial black hole accretion, which I'm about to discuss now. Okay, so let's move on to the last topic, which is uh, primordial black hole accretion. So the overall picture, which was first described in these uh, two uh, publications, primordial black holes, just like any black hole, if you put them surrounded by gas, they will accrete at some accretion rate. So the first step is to compute this accretion rates. Part of this accreted rest mass will be re-radiated. So this is a luminosity. This epsilon here is a radiative efficiency. So the next step of the game is to compute this efficiency. So this gives us some rate of energy injection per unit volume. So the number density of PBHs times the luminosity of each PBH. And again, this is just this fraction of PBHs times rho dark matter over M. Then the next step of the calculation is to compute the efficiency with which this energy which is injected, which is injected into the plasma, actually does get deposited into the plasma. That depends on what exactly is the spectrum and kinds of particles that are injected. Lastly, you propagate this to recombination and then to CMB and isotropies. So let's get started with the accretion rates. So the simplest possible scenario is if you have a black hole, which is stationary, it's not moving, in a gas which is uniform, which is time independent, it has some density rho b, rho baryon, it has some sound speed cs. Note here that the sound speed is no longer, the sound speed is no longer c over square root of three, because we're talking about scales which are much, much smaller than this silk damping scale. And as a consequence, it's really the thermal sound speed of the gas itself, which is 10 to minus five, the speed of flight is much smaller. So this problem has a known solution since I think the forties, if not earlier, this is the bondi hoyle solution. You can construct, first of all, from just simple dimensional analysis, a characteristic radius, which is GM over sound speed squared. This characteristic radius has a physical meaning. It is the radius at which 
the gravitational potential is equal to basically the, the uh, gravitational potential, the gravitational force and the pressure force will uh, basically be equal. From this Bondi radius, you can construct an accretion rate. So you take four pi Bondi radius squared times mass density times a typical velocity, which is the sound speed. And this gives you something that has dimensions of mass per unit time. And it takes this form. So it's rho b times gm squared over sound speed cubed. Now there are multiple complications to this very simple picture. The first one, which is a rather uh, simple complication is, well, what sound speed do we take here? Adiabatic sound speed, but wait a minute, like the gas is actually in close thermal equilibrium with the CMB. So is it more uh, accurately described by an isothermal sound speed? Well, to do this properly, you have to also solve for uh, the heat equation self-consistently, and you have to account for Compton heating by CMB photons to go smoothly between these two regimes. And this actually changes things by a factor of 10, it turns out, uh, by a factor of uh, almost, sorry, almost 10, factor of uh, five in the accretion rate. The second complication is that the this Bondi hole solution here, this Bondi radius is this radius of balance between gravity and pressure, but really in the early universe, baryons which would be accreting onto some uh, point mass effectively would also feel a drag force from the many, many, uh, the very numerous and dense uh, CMB photons. And this will reduce the rate of accretion onto the black hole. So overall, the uh, accretion rate will be some number times uh, m dot bondi, say from the isothermal case. And just to show you this, this is something we computed in this paper. It was also computed in part in uh, Ricotti, Stryker, and Mac. You see that this is, so at early times it reduced because of Compton drug and at late times it reduced uh, because the gas becomes adiabatic versus isothermal. So this function can be computed from first principles. A third complication, which is significantly more difficult to deal with already, is that while well, parameter black holes actually are not expected to be stationary with respect to the baryons. In fact, you can compute the typical relative motion between baryons and dark matter. And this was shown by Tseliakovic and Hirata in 2010. Uh, you can, if, in fact, compute this from taking any CMB Boltzmann code, that this relative motion is supersonic. It's uh, roughly Mach 5 at redshift 1000. And so this means that this will affect the accretion rate quite significantly. And a relatively simple, somewhat ad hoc solution is to replace the sound speed by this effective sound speed, which accounts for the bulk motions of the gas with respect to the black hole. And then you do all your calculation, you account for Compton drag, et cetera. You get some, some accretion rate and the luminosity. And then eventually this relative velocity is you know, itself stochastically distributed. So eventually you have to average your result over the distribution of relative velocities. So doing this, one can compute this accretion rate as I'm showing you here as a function of redshift. And again, you see the effect of Compton drag, et cetera, et cetera. Now, a fourth complication is that this is all assuming some spherical symmetric-ish solution, even though once we put in the relative motion, it's no longer spherically symmetric. Um, but a fourth complication is that actually you might form an accretion disk. So if you have some uh, small scale perturbations in the baryons and the gas accreting on the black hole, it, will, it may happen to have some non-zero angular momentum. And then this non-zero angular momentum means that the gas cannot just accrete you know, radially onto the primordial black hole. And, it, and if the gas can cool sufficiently fast and lose dissipate heat, it will you know, flatten into a disk. And this is something that probably Vivian Poulin will talk about later today. Uh, and describe his paper with his colleagues in 2017, where they uh, try to estimate uh, the result of having an accretion disk. So the next step of the calculation is to compute the radiative efficiency. So this is uh, a very difficult problem in general, how, how efficiently, how much 
black holes accretion flows would radiate. So because none of us CMB people are accretion experts, what we and the goal is here is to try and derive some conservative limit on promoter black hole uh, abundance. What we try to do is to get some estimate of the minimum possible physically plausible radiative efficiency. Okay, and this is so that we can set some conservative bound, bound on the abundance of promoter black holes. So, so I'll, by the way, I'll finish just this radiative efficiency and then I'll take questions and we can finish this story uh, tomorrow. So at the very minimum, if you get some infalling gas from some gas that's infalling onto, uh, onto a black hole, it will get heated and ionized. And at the very minimum, an ionized hot gas will emit bremsschellen or free free radiation. And so in order to estimate how luminous it is, you need to estimate the density and temperature profile of the accreting gas, which is something we do in this uh, paper with Mark and Minkowski. So you have some regions where you have some just adiabatic compression, which changes the, temp the temperature radius dependence changes once the electrons become relativistic here. And then depending on whether the luminosity of the black hole is large enough to photoionize the gas or if the gas gets ionized, collisionally ionized. And so if, if the gas is collisionally ionized, then you will transfer some of the thermal energy into you know, ripping off the electrons from the protons. And this will change, this will create some plateau in the temperature profile. And so this will lead to a lower temperature at the Schwarzschild radius, okay? So doing so, we can estimate the temperature around the Schwarzschild radius as a function of redshift in these two cases. And you see that it differs by something like a factor of 50. This is just to give you some order of magnitude of the uncertainty in the problem, even after simplifying it a lot. And from this, because we know how the gas free for a given temperature, the luminosity and free free radiation, we can estimate this efficiency parameter, which here is just multiplied by this Eddington luminosity over m dot c squared. So from this, you can estimate the average luminosity of the black hole. Again, this averages over relative velocities as a function of redshift. And again, this luminosity actually can be substantially larger if you assume uh, uh, typical efficiencies for disk-like accretion. But the issue here, and you should make sure to ask this to Vivian, is to prove to you without beyond reasonable doubt that promoter black holes do form a disk. So it's 11, well, it's uh, whatever, it's two minutes before the hour, so maybe I'll stop here so I don't go over uh, the next talk. I don't know if I have there. Yeah, thanks, Yassine. Um, that, that was a great introduction. Um, so there's a couple of questions. Uh, one comes from Suchetna Chatterjee. Uh, what kind of redshifts are we talking about when you are talking about the accretions? Um, and what is the gas exactly here? What is the primordial black hole accretion? Right, so, yeah, so here I'm showing the range of redshifts. So here this goes all the way to 10 to the five because I also wanted to compute the spectral distortions. So in fact, all the way to 10 to the six. But it turns out the spectral distortions are much less important. Uh, so really we want, we're specific, specifically interested in redshift around a thousand and say a few hundred to a couple thousand. And so the gas here is the primordial plasma is uh, hydrogen and helium, uh, whose you know, mean density we presumably know very well because we you know, can reproduce the CMB uh, measured power spectra. So yeah, the, the PBH is accreting you know, hydrogen and helium uh, gas, you know, ionized hydrogen and mostly neutral helium. Right. So it must also be accreting the dark matter, right? Um... So that's a very good question. It, it's a, it would be a different accretion uh, problem for dark matter because the gas is yeah. collisional right. and the dark matter is collisionless. And again, this depends if you say that if primordial black holes are the dark matter, or not, but if they are not all of the dark matter and the rest of it could be some wimp-like or particle-like right. dark matter, yeah. indeed, and maybe Vivian will talk about this as well, uh, the fact that there is some dark particle dark matter halo that forms around the parameter black hole, <coughs> this can moreover feed back onto the accretion problem and can speed up the accretion of gas because you get uh, an effectively larger mass due to the halo of dark matter around the parameter black hole. 
But I mean, even if it is primordial black holes, they could merge as well, right? I mean, creation. If it's primordial, if it's, it could be, for example, if it's if you have some black holes are, are a few hundred or a thousand solar masses, and then you have a bunch of them which are much much smaller in masses, then it's as if they were particle uh, right. dark matter. Yeah. Merging is a different question, which we will also talk about tomorrow. Great. Uh, so there's one more, and then maybe we can move on to the next talk. Um, how would the constraints on primordial black holes for masses greater than two times 10 to the four Emson change if Gaussianity assumption is dropped? Right. So basically, the, if if you assume, if, if uh, perturbations are Gaussian, then you know the probability distribution to have a perturbation greater than 0.1. It's like an error function of you know, 0.1 over uh, the variance. If it's non-Gaussian, if you have, say, a very long tail at large densities for the PDF of the density perturbation, then it might be much easier to reach 0.1. And so maybe you have a much weaker constraint. Maybe even with 10 to the minus 5 uh, RMA, uh, you know, variants of density perturbations, you, can, you still have a substantial tail <coughs> that goes all the way to 0.1. So in general, the, the constraints uh, could become weaker if you drop Gaussianity. Okay. Uh, well, let's thank uh, Yasin again for this wonderful talk. He has been up uh, at 11 o'clock and 11 to 12. Now it's midnight in NYU, uh, in New York. Uh, so thanks a lot, Yasin. Um, I, um, I, I guess it is very hard to convey appreciation through, uh, through clapping on this online platform. But thanks a lot.